So I was in I was in the pub there a little while ago, and I met this this man, and he was a bit depressed. Uh, I think the Irish pastime is to be depressed. We love being depressed because uh, it makes for good stories often. And I asked him, I said, why, why are you depressed? And he said, um, he says, I run a hotel. And he said, the magic is gone. He says, a lot of our revenue comes from weddings and it's not like it used to be. I says, how do you mean it's not like it used to be? And he said, well, this is the bloody brides. And he says, you know, they used to come in years ago and they were all excited and they were all naive and, and, they, and I'd tell them, I'm going to make a wonderful wedding for you and I'd be able to tell them all these things. I'll give you extra flowers and you'll get all this sort of special treatment. Um, and now they come in and they say, I know you give us the flowers. I know you got the, the red carpet, but the hotel down the road has given us this, 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 and this. And there's another hotel 20 miles away that's given us this, 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 and this. And he says, what am I going to do? He says, the magic is gone. He says, uh, and why, why is that? I said, the bloody internet. He says, they're all going on the internet now. And he says, they're talking to each other. Yeah, he says, there's, there's these brides' websites becoming a bride, before you become a bride. And they go on these bloody websites and they talk to each other. And they come in here then and they want an even better deal. Right? The magic is gone. Right? And that's, that's a problem in a lot of the world, that the brides are coming together. Right? And they're talking to each other. And they often know more about what the hotel has to offer than the bloody manager himself or doesn't have to offer. There's a collapse of trust in modern societies. Back in the 50s, the late 50s, over 70% or thereabouts of people trusted uh, government in the United States. And now it's down to about 20%. And that's a, that's a, big, a big change. It's the same in Europe. Uh, either individual governments or trust in the EU in general. Just in, in four years, and I know this was the financial crisis, but it's a, it's a trend that has been going down. In Belgium, trust in the EU dropped from 72% to 50%. We see in the UK, it was already very low, 36, and down to 17%. And in January 2014, um, Europe's public trust plunges, right? Stories about how it's continuing to go even lower in the environment. Trust in basic media has got to an all-time low. Trust in media, an all-time low in most uh, Western or, or advanced uh, societies. So there's, there's a collapse in trust in, in all sorts of institutions. <coughs> People in the UK were asked, what do you associate with the EU? So they're the most skeptical, they're the most cynical. And what you would expect them to say is um, loss of national power. That, that's pretty much expected, because that's a constant theme in the debates. But that wasn't the number one factor. That wasn't the number one factor in the collapse of, of trust in the EU. The number one issue for citizens of the UK was bureaucracy. Right? Number one issue was not la loss of national power, it was bureaucracy. And what is another word for bureaucracy? Complexity. Right? So it used to be that complexity was, was pow a powerful thing in less, lesser educated societies. Um, there's an old saying, I don't know if you've heard it, but it says, if you can't dazzle them with diamonds, baffle them with bullshit. Right? And people were easily baffled 20 or 30 or 40 years ago by bullshit. 
And complexity is often bullshit. The most corrupt countries, the most corrupt institutions enhance complexity because complexity allows, it, if corruption feeds on complexity, uh, and complexity hides things. So if you're overpricing your customers, if you're uh, dealing badly with your customers, hide it through complexity. Hide it through complexity. That's a, a classical organizational ply, right? But it's not working. It's not working so well anymore. Um, branding, which is also bullshit, right, is basically like antibiotics. Branding is like antibiotics. We're becoming immune to it. All these, all these marketing tricks, we're becoming more and more immune to it. So these, these are some of the reasons why uh, uh, trust is uh, collapsing. So this, uh, the Edelman trust barometer, people like yourself, over 60% uh, trusted. And this is the big change, because there's a shift in trust. There's a shift in where, where pe who do people trust? So as, as they say, an uh, expert and a person like yourself, twice as credible as a, as a CEO. Right. More people trust an ordinary worker than trust a CEO. Right. So there's a collapse in trust in figureheads in particular. People at the top, whether they are priests or CEOs or, or, or politicians, there's uh, a, a collapse in trust there. So search engines are now the most trusted. But what do, what do search engines reflect? Search engines reflect individualized behavior, me doing things, me looking for things. So we trust ourselves much more than we used to. And we trust people like ourselves much more than we used to. And we trust much less the people up there. Uh, and I wonder why. So there's, there's almost diametrically opposed lines. As you see, this is over a 15 year period because people like myself trust in back around 2002, 2003 was only at about 20%. Only at about 20% in the Edelman uh, trust parameter survey, which is done all over the world. So there's this been real phenomenon where there's been a collapse in trust in organizations and CEOs and figureheads and a rise in trust in me, me and my peers, which is, of course, what social media is, what all these, these spaces are. Social media is actually me and my peers, not me and the brand, you know? Although the brands and the organizations would like to think that. Even workers don't trust their own leaders, right? 45% of US workers don't even trust their own leaders. That's extraordinary, right? So even within organizations, 45% distrust their own leadership. Why? Well, this is an interesting reason why. The more loyal you are, the more you are treated as a sucker. Right? Employees who stay in companies longer than two years get paid 50% less. It's not, this is not from the Socialist Weekly, it's from Forbes, the ultra-capitalist magazine. So the more loyal you are to the organization, the more you get screwed. That's one of the reasons why there's a collapse in trust, and it's the exact same with customers. The loyal, there's ways organizations look at customers. You're, you're with the organization five years, you're, you're doing business with a company five years, you're a sucker, right? You're doing business with a company 10 years, you're a mega sucker. You're doing business with a company 15 years, you're a mega, mega sucker, right? And you'll get charged three times or four times the price of what a new customer will get. So that, that's why trust has collapsed because there has been a historical imbalance in the relationship between organizations and individuals or uh, citizens or customers. And what has happened 
is that the customers and the workers have discovered uh, about this through the web and through talking to their peers, and they've realized that all this stuff has been happening for the last 30 or 40 years. So there's a rebalancing. It used to be the organization was up here with all the knowledge and all the power, and, and the citizen or the customer was down here. And now we've a, we've a kind of an equalization. It's not as if the customer has become utterly dominant, but we've got a, a rebalancing of the power structure. And that has huge implications uh, for the future of organizations. Here, here's the thing that happened. Why, why are most intranets absolutely crap? You know, does anyone here have a decent intranet? digital workplace that, that is anyway remotely use, useful, right? Have you ever tried like enterprise search? You know, what an abomination, right? You know, it's, it, it's an abomination because management don't want it to be easy for the workers. And in fact, I, I talked to um, a guy a couple of months ago who was launching a new sales management system. And the sales management system, part of it was entering in leads, right, for the sales reps. And the old system, the old sales management system had three steps to enter in lead, for a sales rep to enter in a lead. Do you know how many steps the new system had? Thirteen. And they were saying, it would be great for senior management. You know, because they'll get all the data fed up, et cetera, et cetera. Because often there's this, there's, there's this opposition. There's this global survey on, you know, which groups consistently get the most attention when we simplify things, right? Management, executives. Which groups get the least attention? Workers. Right. Often we make it easier for management and we make it harder and harder for employees. And as a result of that, Employees are disconnected and overwhelmed. So there's, there's a global undermining of trust in institutions. And it is the institutions who are doing the undermining of the trust, right? By their behavior. Here's a story. Why, why don't we trust CEOs? Well, maybe this is why. Right? This, this is from the 90s. And actually, in the noughties, it got even worse. Right, it got even worse. CEO pay rose by an average of 535%. Right, 535%. Ordinary worker pay rose by 32%, just a little bit above inflation. Right. That's a big gap, but you'll say, the CEOs are brilliant, they're amazing. They added so much value to the economy because they're so clever and genius. They're the creative 1%. We need to bow to them because they're so brilliant. Without them, everything would collapse. Right. Except that when you look at the stock market, well, the stock market went up 300%, but actually profits, Profits only of S&P companies only went up 115%. So there seems to be a little bit of a gap problem, doesn't there? You know, I wonder why we don't trust CEOs, right? We have a new generation, right? A new generation. It's the first generation in a way that are better educated and poorer than their previous generation, with less, see, less of a future of progress. All previous generation, more, so we're going to, things are going to get better. We're, my career is going to get better. There's going to be progress. This is the first generation in modern societies that might see a decline in their income over uh, their actually uh, careers. And they know this because they're talking to their peers, right? They're using Google, they're using LinkedIn, Twitter. You know, they're, they're organizing for themselves. They are skeptical, right? They are analytical. They are cynical. They are ethical in many uh, ways. And they are disloyal, right? These are the millennials, right? These are the people, the, 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 the new workforce and the new consumers. This is engagement, employee engagement, you, in, in, in the United States. Right? 
millennials, 29%, 70%, 71% are not engaged with their jobs. Isn't that an extraordinary number? Disillusioned, overwhelmed, not interested in, 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 in the work that they have. They are the least engaged. You see the traditionalists who are dying off. They're the people back in the 50s who really thought government always did the right thing, who, that companies always did the right thing. They are the traditional mega, mega suckers. <laughs> that, that stayed with their companies 10 or 15 years and believed in silly concepts like loyalty. Right. You know, the millennials don't believe in that because organizations don't believe in it. Right. So the truth is coming out. So we've new generation. And millennials is not a generation. It is an attitude. It is an attitude that is pervading all generations today. We go to search because we want to verify. We want to check up. We go to the web because we want to compare. That's the top task in a great many environments uh, in, in, in the online world. I don't know if you remember this slide, those of you who are long enough involved in this whole digital revolution thing. I've been involved in it since 1994, and this was, a, this was one of the first slides. You know, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. I was a great, it was, it was cute. But that has been superseded by a new a new version which says, remember when on the internet nobody knew you were a dog? You know, because everybody knows everything about big data. You know, it's gone from that world of innocence. Yeah, we can be anonymous, we can, we can do whatever, to the world of, of big data. So there's, there's a sense of, you know, the, the state and, and, and companies knowing so much Edward Snowden is a hero to the millennials all, all around the world, even, even in the United States, right? He's, he's seen as a heroic figure to the millennial generation. And the whole sense of privacy and my rights and my rights to my own information, this is going to be a major, you know, challenge or major opportunity going forward of people's rights to their own information. And they will trade their information if they get genuine value, if, they're, if, if they, it's not mistreated, if, if you deliver a good, customized, personalized result for them, they will trade their information. But they are cognizant, aware that their information is being used and their information is an asset that what they do is, is an asset. So big data is an issue. The great designer, another thing about what caused a lot of this distrust is styling. It's, I forget who said it yesterday, but you know, when they ask people, about what's design? It's styling. That's what most, most people say. Styling, as James D Dyson of Dyson Hoover's and many other wonderful uh, products that actually work. You know, these products work and they work well. They don't break down. I, I've had a, a Dyson and they don't have those bags that you have to keep replacing every six weeks that you get ripped off on. You, you have to pay a, a good bit up front, but you get a great product, right? So you get a great product. There's a room in this world to deliver great products and great services. That's what millennial wants. That's what the new generation uh, wants. They said styling for its own sake is a lazy 20th century conceit. We need to reclaim you know, design and branding from the people who have controlled it for the last 30 or 40 years, who have turned it into marketing propaganda and false imagery and marketing bullshit jargon and actually deliver things that actually work and work well. I talked about antibiotics and marketing. I've been involved. I do a lot of testing. Most of my work is observing behavior, how, how customers behave, how they react, what, what, what they do with things. So this financial institution, it tested uh, two 
images. There were two, two approaches to, uh, it's the exact same content, it's the exact same offer, right? Increase your 401k contribution from 5%. Did you know, right? One is an image, one doesn't have an image. Now, trained in marketing school, the image is going to work because people love images and people go, oh, it's an image. Yeah, somebody like me and, and she's really good looking. I'd like to go out with her and I'll buy a 401k. Oh, you have me organization. Well, that's the way, that's the way we're trained in marketing. Yeah, put these big, put these actors who are pretending to be our customers on the home page, you know, with really good smiley teeth and they'll, buy more of our products, those silly sucker customers. Right, that's the, th that's the thinking, right? So, you know, that, that works, doesn't it? That works. Well, when they tested it, they found no image, no image had over 90% accuracy, right, among, among customers, an image under 80%. 80 the image reduced the accuracy the people felt about the accuracy. Now, I've got hundreds of these, hundreds of these. If you want to uh, get somebody ignore you know, something that you have, put it in a big image, on, on the, a really well-designed image on the homepage or, or wherever, if you really want people to ignore it. And if you totally want people to ignore it, put it in the right column uh, as well as a, as a big image. That's guaranteed. You want to hide stuff, put it in a huge big image saying, look at me, look at me and they'll totally ignore it, right? Because the eyes, psychologically, we become ignoring all, all this sort of stuff, right? In fact, not just do we ignore the image, we ignore about a couple of centimeters around the image. There's a kind of, the poison leaks out to the, to the rest of the environment and, 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 and pollutes and corrupts it. This was the first website. Well, the first website that they've, they, they found, anyway, in the World Wide Web, Tim, uh, CERN, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, CERN Institute, back around 1992. So that was the World Wide Web. World Wide Web is a hypermedia information. So that was, that was the original web concept linking, right? There's gov.uk. I mean, what? Where is the innovation? Where is the progress? I mean, what about these guys? I mean, I, I, I know British people are, I always thought they were clever and smart and witted and modern, and, 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 and they give us this for, for gov.uk? That's incredible. You know, we need interactivity. We need, we need, we need to show that we are modern and progressive. Well, interestingly, Gov.uk is probably the most successful government exercise in digital in the world, bar none. Bar none. Right. Because Gov.uk doesn't give a crap how it looks. It's focused on how it works. Right. And interestingly, the Design Museum in 2013 gave Gov.uk the top design of the year award. The first time it had ever given an award to a website, it usually gives it to bridges or buildings or whatever, and shortlisted for the award that year was the, uh, the Olympic flame. You know, it was the first time it ever gave an award to a digital entity, and it gave it to gov.uk because it was a website that worked, right? And the interest, and you know, governments around the world, and I deal with a lot of governments, they absolutely hate gov.uk. They hate gov.uk. Because you know one of the things gov.uk did? It took the politicians away. Right? There's no news. There's no, there's no big pictures of politicians saying, look at all the good things we're doing for you, you know, on gov.uk. Right? It just focuses on... Do you want to get a driving license? It focuses on what you want to do. And yet, it's hugely successful, and it has brought a lot of kudos to UK politicians. So UK politicians have won in the process of serving their citizens rather than creating designs, sitting in front of their uh, citizens saying, look at all the things I'm doing for you. Right. 
Here's the mantra. And here's the mantra of we heard yesterday in, in, in all the design. This is where the design world is going. How, what's the philosophy of gov.uk? We focus on user needs relentlessly. You know, about whether it was frog design. Get out in the world. People talk about, we, I heard yesterday about touch points. Touch points are an oxymoron. We don't touch the customer with touch points. They're not even near us. Touch points are ways by which we don't touch the customer. Right? They are ways by which we keep the customer at a long distance away from it. They're touching a screen. They're not touching us. There's the touch. We are removing touch. We are removing interaction with our customers. More and more, 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, the percentage of people in an organization who actually, some way or another, interacted with a customer was vastly greater than the percentage today. Whether you were in a bank or whatever, people came into the bank. Now they don't even come into the bank because they've got touch points. <laughs> yeah. We are removing the touch points. We're not introducing more touch points. We are removing them. And because we're removing them, we need new strategies to get out, to be with our customers. Because we've never been with our customers less. We have never been with our customers less than in this day, 2015. And if we keep doing that, we will become more and more alienated from understanding their needs and how they live and how they work. So we have to get out there. This is the opposite of, of gov.uk. It was uh, healthcare.gov when it launched. Obviously, obviously created by a marketing branding agency. Yeah. Lovely young girl, she's smiling. I want insurance. I want insurance. I want insurance because I want her. I want to marry her and I'll get insurance uh, to do that. Because I, I had such a happy time. She's, she went through the application process and she was delighted. She was laughing. She was having such fun. You'll have fun too if you go through the insurance. What's that communicate? Something like that. So here's what actually happened, you know, in, in, in the process. Sibelius, who was the head of the Department of Health, apologizes for miserably frustrating uh, uh, Obamacare website rollout. Nightmare in cyberspace, Obama and its website, right? How six people signed up, right? Six people signed up on day one, right? Barack Obama, not happy. Now, that, that was understating things. Not, not, <laughs> not happy. For the first time, for the first time in U.S. history, the President of the United States got in front of a podium in front of the White House and had to apologize for a website. First time it ever happened in, in U.S. history. Right? But I love this one. I love this one. Obamacare website official. Sorry for problems, but system working. Yeah. Because that's the thinking of a lot of the people. Well, technically it does work. It may take 364 steps and 17 hours to get insurance, but it works. It, it all integrates properly. It just takes a while. Right. That, that was the culture. Is it, technically, it's working. So now we can go on to the next project that we'll make a massive cock up of and we launch it on time, and it'll be another nightmare. Yeah, and that, that was the call. Technically, it's working. Well, that wasn't good enough. They basically fired everybody, right? And they started afresh. And here's what they came back with, a website where you can actually do things rather than smiley faces uh, grinning out at you. Because she was saying, I got insurance. Yeah, you, you try and get yours, right? <laughs> C plan, apply now, use your new coverage, right? So they radically, they brought in a whole new, they brought in the Obama SWAT team that he used to win the election because he, he had the most sophisticated campaign in, in history, right? And within, within about six months, it, uh, so, so, sign up soared, right? Simplicity. You know, there's a huge business case for simplicity. 
But they said, we can't make it simple because we've all got these internal complex systems and they all have to integrate. There's always excuses for complexity. There's always excuses for complexity, right? But the dramatic uh, 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 tops a million, and it went from being the most hated website to being the most usable website, voted the most usable website within a six month. If you really focus, if you really focus on simplicity, there's a hell of a lot you can achieve. Mainly, it's, it's a, a deliberate, no, you're either trying to hide something through complexity or else it's just an internal laziness. Because actually, to make it easier for the customer, you have to initially make it harder for the organization. There's a greater internal stress. To create simplicity creates organizational complexity. To create customer simplicity creates organizational complexity. Customer complexity creates organizational simplicity, makes it easier for, for the organization. You can't fake it anymore. Right? This year, this was when Vi Vista launched. The wow, look, the wow starts now. Don't, they look really wowed, don't they? they look, I mean, that, that is a wow picture. That, that, is a, that is a wow, that is a wow picture. Now, I, I, I spoke to a marketing person, from, a senior marketing person from Microsoft about, about Vista. And uh, I said, oh, God, you must, you must have had a terrible time around it. Yeah, she said, oh, it was terrible. Was terrible. But we, we felt that we failed. We really failed as marketers. And I said, why did you fail as marketers? Because we couldn't convince people Vista didn't suck. I said, but it did suck. <laughs> yeah, but the job of marketing is to convince you that it doesn't suck, even if it does. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, you failed, yeah, because if it sucks, no, all the marketing on earth won't unsuck it. <laughs> you know, so in this day and age, we don't believe the marketing. We'll decide, we go beyond the marketing. We go to use. So where do you rebuild uh, trust in this day and age? You build it through use, right? This National Health uh, Service in the UK, right? So we, we did work and we identified what's the top task of citizens uh, connected with the NHS. And the top task was check symptoms. People came to the website to check, check up symptoms. So we started testing uh, the, the website with people and we give them a certain that you've got a stomach pain, you've got, you know, you've got a headache, you've got a couple other conditions. What might that be symptom of? So this one person was searching for trying to solve one of these tasks and they put in stomach pain, right? And basically the first result came back was real stories. You because know, they said, we love real stories. Customers love real stories, like blogging. Let's have lots of real stories. Okay, here's a real story for you. Stomach cancer, right? <laughs> During treatment for a stomach ulcer, Deborah Nifton was devastated to find out that she had stomach cancer. At the age of 40, she had st surgery to remove her stomach. Now, I only searched for stomach pain. <laughs> right? Is that, is that going to enhance trust? You know, and, and uh, so I, I presented that to a room. It was about 80 people from the NHS web team. And they all went, oh my God, that's terrible. And then I said, uh, but who's responsible? Nobody was responsible. People were responsible for blogging. People were responsible for content. People were responsible for the search engine, but not the search engine results. Interestingly enough, uh, they were responsible for usability. They were responsible for all sorts of things. But nobody was responsible for this, the outcome, the experience of the customer, the, 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 the stuff that was coming back. Everybody washed their hands. And then a couple of months later, they said to me, oh, things are getting better. Search, search engine has improved. Search engine has improved. And uh, says, oh, oh, how has it improved? We've added a new feature. Oh, you've added a new, that's very good. What, what have you done? We, now you have type ahead. Oh, wonderful. So this, this was an improvement. They thought this would solve this sort of problem. So I went to the website and you went, S-C-O-M, cancer to stomach.
<laughs> so you've got a you've got a pain in your stomach. You've got a pain in your stomach. And you go into your doctor. And you sit down, the doctor says, How's it going? Oh, not too bad. Oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm feeling not bad. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Your, your doctor says, I have a bit of a problem with my stom stomach cancer. Let me tell you about Deborah Nifton. Right? <laughs> Would you go back to that doctor? Yeah. This is how, you know, these are the things that build trust today. Use. Right? You go to an environment and you'll use it to try and do something. And if it doesn't give you good results or doesn't allow you to do something well, you don't trust it. Trust will never be regained. We will never ever get back to 70% levels of trust in any institution. It's over, finished, right? People are far more educated today. They're talking to each other. So the levels of historical trust are gone and will never return, right? And we will trust on a case-by-case -case basis today based on using something. We won't listen to the marketing. We go, let me use it. Then I'll judge whether it's trusting. We do a lot of work with technology companies. And, and people into technology companies were saying, oh, yeah, co uh, potential customers are much different from current customers in their tasks. No, they're not. Potential customers come to Cisco and they want to figure out downloading software, installation. They're going to the support website to take Cisco for a test drive. Right? They're going to the support website, where the, which is terrifying the marketers. Right? Before they buy the product, they're going and they're finding out about configuration, installation, troubleshooting. That's what customers are doing today. Right? Right? There's a whole shift in the way we buy things and the way we evaluate things. So, trust is, 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 is use and trust is putting the customer first. So, most organizations say that, but they don't believe it, right? And they certainly don't do it. Google makes 90% of, of its money through advertising. Google makes 90%. So this, what I'm going to show you, doesn't make sense. I, I don't like, the winters in Ireland very dark and it gets dark about 4.30 in the morning. I often would be searching for the, the sunrise. What time is the sunrise? And see, you get the, you get the sunrise here and it's, the first result is good. You click on it and you find out what time. And there, uh, th this winter, I went and I put in uh, Dublin sunrise, and he here's what happened. 8.13. You know, that, that, now, that, that runs contrary to the idea of selling advertising, because if you give them the answer straight away, you know, your ability to sell advertising declines in the process. But see, Google d doesn't say the customer is the advertiser. They say the customer is the person who searches. And if we can answer, uh, if they've got 100 questions, right, and you know, 30 of them they want immediate answers for, then they'll still come back to us for the other 70, which we can sell advertising on. So this is a, some of these are a loss lead because they're saying, what does the customer really want? The customer doesn't want search results. Oh, I love 10 search results in the morning just before coffee. <laughs> you know, the, the people don't want search results. They want answers. So it's great when you come to that and you get 8.13. Yeah, it's 8. Great. I didn't have to click. Right. So it's focused on how quickly can you get me the answer? Can you solve my problem? So that's how you build trust with a skeptical audience. They will use you. And if they can use you to do the thing they need to do, they'll use you more. And if they can't, they won't. Right? So the biggest challenge I'm going to finish is, is the biggest thing, the hardest thing, this is the hardest thing in the world I'm going to uh, uh, talk to you about now that we need to try and achieve. And it's, it's, kind of, it's connected with this, at least in, in some way. This woman has a dog, right? And here's her dog. Because right? yeah. did you ever notice that you, if you have a dog, if the dog doesn't look 
like you when you as a baby it'll get to look like you as it gets older you know i don't know how, how dogs are either they they get you know they, they they go off and have surgery or something like that or <laughs> you know plastic surgery i want to be like my owner uh, cuz if i'm like my owner he love me more or she loved me more. So there's, there's a whole industry of plastic surgery for dogs saying, I want to be like her. I want to be, I want to be like her. Uh, okay, so, th but that's the nature. We, we surround ourselves with things that make us feel good. Organizations are tribes. We are internal focused, right? We are all tribes. We all, we had millions of years we've been tribes. We're not going to change uh, anytime soon. So if this guy had a dog, what sort of a dog would he have? Ah, th yeah, there you go. Uh, so, you know, right? And if this lady had a dog, right? She'd have a dog like that, right? So that, that's okay, that's our nature. It is not within our nature to put the customer first. It is unnatural to focus on the customer. It is much more natural to focus on the organization and to have, you know, messaging that makes us feel good about ourselves. Because most websites are not created for customers, they're created for organizations to feel good about themselves. Most products, most, in, in many ways, we talked yesterday about uh, design, not designer first. Many ways, the designers create things that make them feel good and that they can show off to their peers. It, it happens in every industry and in every sector. So here is you, the organization. It's okay, right? That, it's okay, right? You look like this, but this is the dog the customer wants. You know, and you probably won't even like that dog, right? But you know what? It's not for you. <laughs> the dog isn't for you. The dog is for your customer. Right? So in many situations, oh, I'm bored with this, or no, we need a change, or we need, this is not for you. You get paid to be bored. <laughs> right? It's point 12 on your employee contract. You will be bored. Think of your salary. Right? So this is the dog your customer wants. And that's why it's hard. The hardest thing of all is empathy. It's easy, easy to empathize with people who are like you and people around you. It's much harder to empathize with people who have dogs like that. <laughs> yeah, but that's your customer. Right? I used to do a lot of work with persona design over, over the years. And I used to have all these pictures of people, right, and I'd say, oh, now is, now is the time to, and I'd say, we, let's go into the workshop groups, now come up here and collect your persona, your picture of the person that you're going to work, John the salesman or whatever, and I noticed, I had about 50 or 60 pictures, and I noticed that always the beautiful people got chosen first, <laughs> right, everybody went for the beautiful people, because they weren't looking for customers, they were looking for things that reflected them. Right. So the greatest challenge of all is empathy. Empathy is the hardest thing. And in a world, digital removes empathy. It creates walls. These touch points are not touch points. They are walls between us and our customers. So how do we get outside? How do we get over the walls and into the lives of our customers? That's the greatest challenge. Finish Aristotle's universe. Aristotle was a very clever guy but he got a couple of things wrong, right? And, but this is classic organizational, classical human, human thinking. So I'm, going, I'm giving you a technique now of empathy. It's a very difficult technique, but I believe in your ability to embrace it. And many people have embraced it with, with good results. So we all know what happened to uh, the guy who said, the earth isn't the center of the universe, right? Right, uh, Copernicus, right? burned at a stake or whatever. Tell me if, tell me if this is, is true or not. Most employees who are genuinely customer-centric, it's career limiting. Right? It's career limiting in most organizations. If you are genuinely customer-centric, you're not going to rise in most organizations. 
Well, you're going to rise in the new organizations that need to emerge to succeed in this world. So how do we, how do we get away from this, this thinking? So this is, this is the magical moment that we are the center of the universe. So this, I want you to concentrate on this image for the moment and imagine that you're there or imagine your organization is there. Just uh, if you really do it hard, concentrate, try and see your, your, your company somewhere on that page. And, and if we do it, I believe in extrasensory perception. Wow, that was amazing. I didn't prepare that at all. That just, that just came up there from the audience, from, from the members of the audience, right? So now, just to finish, I want you to repeat slowly after me, right? And, and this is a, new, a technique I'm going to give you that you can use in your work, right? I want you to repeat slowly after me. We are not the center of the universe. <laughs> Come on, I believe in you. Come on. We are not the center of the universe. So every day before you start work, you get together in a group hug and you all go, we are not the center of the universe. The customer is. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Um, we have time for maybe two questions to Jerry. Does anyone have a question to Jerry? <laughs> oh, Can you name any company that already has understood what you said? There, there aren't too many, but if we see the companies, whether they are imperfect or other, they are the Facebooks, they are the Googles, they are the, they are the Twitters, you know, the, the, uh, they are many of the modern web companies, right? Now, will they keep doing that as they mature? You know, and as you know, most organizations, they destroy themselves from, from within. So the older become the, the more arthritic and so, but many of the successful Amazons, you know, Amazon tells you, you know, Amazon tells you there's a reduction in price. You know, you, you put this in your basket last week, but now, now it's been reduced by, by 50. So many of the really successful web entities followed that model. And, and you could say Apple, you know, Apple may have a di different organizational structure, but it is focused on quality, Dyson companies. There are, there are many companies emerging today that are are following this model, but they probably represent 5% of organizations in the world. But I think with the millennial generation, if the change doesn't occur, new organizations will come through to replace the older organizations. Well, IKEA was a wonderful organization. I IKEA was, was genuinely built on, and, and still is, on, uh, in, in many ways, fairness to the customer, where you can go in and get a decent meal for, you know, five euro. I think the philosophy of IKEA is, is a very, I would s see it fitting in the modern world of, of, of now, it's a big, complex organization, but I think it is. I think it is a right. I think Scandinavia in general is a model of the world, the new world of thinking. The, the kind of Scandinavian mindset uh, is is a is in that frame of thinking. We have one distant question. Okay. Hi, I was wondering if you could comment on information rights a little bit more, um, and if actually people are really cognizant of their rights to information and what you see going on? I, I don't think they are. People are lazy, and, that, and that's why they're exploited. You know, we exploit laziness, so they're not going to check up on this, right? But I think there's a slow, a slow emergent of awareness. I would expect in, in 10 to 15 years that people will carry with them their, their digital passport, 
right, that there'll be a movement away from organizations keeping personal data to actually people keeping their own personal data. I think that's going to be a movement where you'll have a digital passport, where all, all your stuff is, and then you decide whether IKEA can have that, all your usage patterns, or, so I think there'll be a movement of, of human rights, digital rights are becoming a human right. And your, your right to your information, I think, is going to be a next phase. And I think the inevitable outcome of that, there'll be a lot of conflict, but in maybe 10, 15, 20 years, people will own their own information and it'll be stored in a, a kind of a government or non-profit central bank. And then they'll allow organizations access to that or, or depending on what the organization can do, they will trade you know, with, with their information. I think that's a, that's a future. Thank you. Um, we will do, do have... One quick question. Yeah. Did, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so we are, we are out of time. So um, there's uh, coffee downstairs and we will continue at half past in all the rooms. Thank you. Thank you.